In the battle for narratives, who is ahead, the BJP or the Congress, Rahul Gandhi or Prime Minister Modi? I'm Bhart Khatak. You're with the Mojo story. Ever since the fiery last session of Parliament, looking ahead to the next one, there has been a high voltage and extremely personalized political battle unfolding between the leader of the opposition and the Prime Minister. Rahul Gandhi has sought to put the government on the mat on a range of issues, ranging from exam manipulation allegations to the state of loco pilots to Agni Deeps. On the other hand, the Prime Minister has not stopped taking personal swipes at Rahul Gandhi. In Parliament, he called Rahul Gandhi a Balak Buddhi. The Congress today has unveiled its own set of meme attacks, responding with Bail Buddhi as a counter. While this kind of rhetorical battle will go on, the fact is that we are now in a highly highly personalized clash of these two political figures. And this clash is going to define perhaps the political mood in the next few weeks and months to come, certainly the next session of parliament. To talk about the shifting political sands and to make sense of the current political trends, I want to introduce our newsmaker on the program today, Sanjay Kumar, who's of course uh, uh, one of our best known political minds with Lokriti CSDS joins us. Uh, Sanjay ji, always a, always a pleasure. Uh, let's start by asking you, you know, it's quite ironic in the campaign, the opposition wanted very much to avoid the question of Modi versus who. Now they're almost seeking to position this fight as a Rahul versus Modi fight. They, they don't seem to have any defensiveness uh, about it. How do you see this very personalized political battle that is not just determining the headlines, but is also setting the political agenda? Uh, Barka, I think it's very clear. Uh, BJP has lost 63 seats compared to 2019 election. So BJP uh, strength in the Lok Sabha has gone down and a lot of blame is to be given uh, to Prime Minister Modi. So I think Congress is trying to charge Prime Minister Modi. And that is what we have seen in the first five days of uh, the Lok Sabha session. So now it is trying to push BJP trying to push Narendra Modi to the corner. And that is why I think the whole attack is, uh, is meant directly and directly on Narendra Modi. Because on the on the other hand, you see, Rahul Gandhi has not been able, the Congress has not been able to get the seat of the leader of the opposition. Now Congress has a sizable number in the House, 99 seat. Rahul Gandhi is formerly the leader of the opposition. So he wants to charge the government. And that is what we see happening in the parliament in the first five days of the Lok Sabha session. Now, you said that a lot of responsibility for the declining numbers will be placed at the prime minister's door, even if nobody says so openly. But the reverse argument that the BJP would make is that without Modi, they would not have even got the seats they have. He still remains their only calling card. No doubt about that. Uh, it is true. Hypothetically, we see if we look at the 2024 Lok Sabha election, suppose Prime Minister Modi was not the leader of the BJP. If someone else was projected as the prime minister of the BJP or the NDA, what would have happened? I think BJP would have suffered much more badly. So it is true that Prime Minister Modi still remains the vote puller, but his ability to pull votes for the BJP has declined drastically if you compare it with 2019 Lok Sabha election. In 2019 Lok Sabha election, we did a survey and our estimate was that out of every 10 BJP voters, three and a half voted for BJP only in the name of Prime Minister Modi. It has come down to now, you know, uh, two and a half out of 10 voters. So it is 25% compared to 33%. So there is a clearly a decline in Prime Minister Modi's ability to pull votes for the BJP. A lot of people, a lot of voters also blame Narendra Modi for, you know, the various kinds of changes within the party. And the reference is to uh, inducting large number of leaders from various political parties, irrespective of their credentials. So I think that has dented the image of Prime Minister Modi to some extent. I'm still saying Prime Minister Modi still remains most more popular or most popular leader. But if you compare it with his popularity compared to 2019, there is a sharp decline. On the other side of the trenches, Rahul Gandhi has gained massively in, in confidence, in, in self-projection. 
Uh, you even have <coughs> allies like uh, Sanjay Raut saying, oh, if Rahul Gandhi, if we had declared him prime ministerial candidate, we would have done uh, even better. And one of the most high risk moves that uh, Rahul Gandhi has made, uh, but before that, you know, your own uh, CSDS post poll surveys found that while Mr. Modi was uh, significantly ahead of Rahul Gandhi as a prime ministerial option, even after the elections uh, in Uttar Pradesh, in fact, he was Rahul Gandhi was marginally ahead of the prime minister. Now, what I was asking was that Rahul Gandhi, in a way, is now very much not just the leader of the Congress, but he's the leader of the opposition or has assumed that role. I don't just mean in the parliamentary sense, but it's become very much the face of the national opposition. So to that extent, the Congress seems to have shed its earlier reticence about making elections into Modi versus Rahul. No, it is true. Yes, Rahul Gandhi has been elected as a leader of the opposition, leader of the Congress party in the parliament. But the way five days of parliamentary proceedings have taken place in the, in the Lok Sabha, it seems like it is very clear. Most of the regional party are almost, have almost accepted Rahul Gandhi as the leader of the opposition. He has taken charge. And, the, and I think uh, why leaders of the other opposition party may not have reluctance to you know, accept him as the leader of the opposition because look at the issues which he has picked up. Nobody would or, or hardly anybody is going to deny or dis disagree with that. He picked up the issue of Agni Veer. He picked up the issue of NEET and both these connect to the you know problems Indian youths are facing. Now he has picked up the issue of Manipur. You pick up the issue of unemployment. So these are the real issues on the ground. So he's not picking up issues which are you know like very superficial, which is academic in nature. These are all real issues on the ground. So political parties and the leaders of the political parties would like to rally around with these issues. And I think I think that is why Rahul Gandhi is more or less accepted as the leader of the entire opposition in the Lok Sabha. One of the uh, more contentious issues, though, that he's taken up is that of Hinduism itself. So when we saw those images of him holding up the images of Lord Shiva, then followed by Guru Nanak Ji and, you know, other leaders. When we saw all that unfold in Parliament, he was challenging the BJP on Hinduism. Uh, now, do you think that this is a smart move? It's a move that the opposition avoided through the campaign. But at the same time, he also made a controversial statement saying the Ram Mandir movement has been defeated because Faizabad Ayodhya has been won by the opposition. What do you make of Rahul Gandhi's high-risk positioning on Hinduism itself, taking the battle to the BJP's own turf? The first few things which I mentioned that Rahul Gandhi picked up in the parliament, the issues of you know Agni Veer, NEET, and various other issues, I think that that was the clever move. I'm not sure whether uh, you know challenging BJP on the plank of Hindutva is going to be a clever mood, a uh, clever technique, because. Uh, a very large number of Indians still believe BJP's vote share may have gone down by 1% compared to 2019. But still, a very large number of voters in this country believe that a party which cares for the, you know, the needs of the Hindus or, or cares for the Hindus as such is BJP. It's not Congress. So challenging BJP of not being sympathetic to the cause of the Hindus, I don't think that that will be a, that is a clear, uh, that is a clever move. That would be risking uh, the image of Congress or risking or playing into BJP's hand. So I, in my personal opinion, this is not a good move on the part of Rahul Gandhi. So you believe that when he picked up those posters of different gods of different faiths in parliament and challenged uh, Narendra Modi uh, by saying Modi does not equal Hindus, BJP does not equal Hindu Samaj, you believe he should have avoided that conversation altogether? Uh, in my opinion, yes. He should have avoided that uh, that conversation precisely because of two things. First, uh, there are various narratives that you know India Alliance has been able to perform very well because a very large number of minority vote has come in favor of the in India Alliance. Whether we are talking about you know like the votes of the Christian Muslims, the Muslims Muslim vote has polarized in favor of the India Alliance in a very large number, and this comes out from our data and from various other sources. Uh, at the same time, if you look at how BJP has been able to mobilize the Hindu vote, so and the way BJP has been able to send out message to the larger Hindu community by constructing a Ram temple, uh, you know, removal of Article 370 in Kashmir. 
so whatever rahul gandhi may have done so far in the parliament or during last few years but still large number of people are not ready to buy that congress or rahul gandhi is the uh, is the person who would care for the needs of the hindus because there still there is still a suspicion in the mind of large number of indian voters that this is a party which cares more which which cares for the minorities and bjp is the party uh, which goes all and out to say to work for the cause of the hindus so challenging bjp that congress is more sympathetic towards the cause of hindus not the bjp is a risky proposition but but then what is the option before the opposition if it wants to fend off this image of being anti hindu if you remember after its defeat in i think 2000 and and 14 uh, the ak antony report one of the reports that mr antony drafted who son now ironically is with the bjp was that we are a party that is perceived to be anti hindu so you are saying that that pro muslim anti hindu tag to some degree has still persisted even though the party has been defensive about pick, picking up issues on violence against religious minorities the party has dramatically reduced the number of tickets that were given to muslim candidates the party has so, tried to also be very visibly uh, you know believing hindus with photo ops at temples so if it avoids the conversation altogether how does it how does it shake off this image see if you look at the entire run up to 2024 lok sabha election the seven phases of polls and even couple of months before that i don't think that congress got into a conversation on the issue of hindutva uh, like in a cricket you need to score runs but you if you aim to score run on each and every ball the batsman is facing you sometimes put yourself in a difficult situation there are balls which you think you need to just leave aside don't even it do, don't even take a chance to hit that ball i think that should have been the that should be the strategy why to get into this whole conversation of which party is uh, more uh, championing the cause of hindutva you could leave you can uh, you can just skip this discussion because bjp is not pulling you uh, into this discussion it was an unnecessary discussion in my opinion so like in a cricket match when the batsman is on the ground uh, he wishes to score as many runs as possible but still he has an strategy he does not want to hit each and every ball there could be some balls he want to just leave aside if the ball is offside on the or down the leg side doesn't want to touch that ball at all i think that should be the strategy yes uh, the uh, congress want to corner the bjp in, on as many fronts as possible but there could be issues which can be left aside there was no issue, there was no uh, necess- there was no necessity in the lok sabha at that time to you know get into this whole discussion on hindutva or which party is championing the cause of the hindutva so i think uh it was in my opinion an unnecessary discussion to be brought in the parliament now on the flip side the question for the bjp and my question to you is does hindutva have diminishing returns for the bjp has it reached a saturation point uh you know that would be it would be tempting to come to that conclusion looking at the results in uttar pradesh but then madhya pradesh is very different so what how do we understand hindutva's political utility to the bjp in modi's third term question on the issue of identity whether we are talking about the caste identity or religious identity it has a shelf life there is uh, and it gives diminishing return i would just refer to the bihar politics when lalu yadav became the chief minister of bihar in the early 90s and he led a successful political career and rjd was such a strong party for the first 15 years and the issue of mobilization was you know the caste was used as a tool for mobilization and soon after that we saw that there was a huge there was a massive decline in rjd support base similarly if i look at the national politics and that was that happened even in up in 2024 lok sabha election so hindutva was being used as a tool for mobilization of the voters it did pay dividend to the bjp in 2014 i don't say that 2014 election was not on the hindutva but 2019 and after that between 2019 and 2024 various state assembly elections were also contested on the issue of hindutva or hindutva was used as a primary tool for mobilizing the voter i think there is a limit to that and that 2024 verdict has indicated that you know a party cannot go 
very, very aggressive for a very long time on this issue of Hindutva. That's a big message for BJP or that's a signal for the BJP. So uh, the question then is what will be Modi's central narrative in his third term? If Hindutva has actually, uh, you know, reached a, a kind of uh, a kind of dead end or not dead end, but a kind of, you know, certainly in the stage of diminishing returns, uh, then Modi has to find another message, right? And what is that message? Uh, and is that what you see the BJP actually uh, struggling for uh, or struggling with in a sense that where Rahul Gandhi is playing on the offensive, you know, he's playing on the front foot. Like you said, he's picking up NEET, he's picking up Agnivir, he's picking up local pilots, he's picking up Manipur. How is the, How does the incumbent position himself? What is his narrative? Does Modi need a new story? If that story is not Hindutva, if that story is not nationalism, and it still may well be nationalism, we don't know. What is that story? I'm not saying that BJP is completely going to junk the issue of nationalism or the Hindutva agenda. They will try and carry this agenda forward, but not as aggressively as they have done after 2019. But it is. Uh, but I do agree that they need to look for search for new narratives. And what could be that narrative? I think that new narrative has to be somewhat, somewhat around you know the the story of growth, uh, focused more on the youth of this country because uh, there there are various. And like, if you connect the dots, Rahul Gandhi is picking up whether it is Agni Veer, unemployment, uh, and various other issues. It connects to the youth. So some narrative has to be, you know, looked for, looked for by Prime Minister Modi, by BJP, uh, and that is the only way which can strengthen BJP in the coming years. They cannot keep moving on with the two big narratives which which they have used in the past for political mobilization: Hindutva, Ram Mandir, and nationalism. I can see the diminishing returns of Hindutva, but why do you think there are diminishing political returns to nationalism? Again, like you said that the Congress reputationally has been the party soft on uh, religious minorities, the BJP has been soft on Hindus, the BJP has always positioned itself as the muscular nationalist party, as the party that, you know, did surgical strikes after Uri and, and Balakot after Pulwama and the Congress tried to say, we have also done strikes across the border, but nobody was interested in listening to them then. Today might be different. Why do you think nationalism per se has also you know, reached a point where it may not yield political dividends like earlier? Two, two issues. First, yes, nationalism is an issue which people uh, would keep supporting. But if you juxtapose nationalism with some kind of a crisis moment, then it becomes more important for the voter. It becomes more important for the people. But if it is a normal time, the issue of nationalism cannot be on the top of voters' mind. But at the same time, we should not forget that along with the nationalism, yes, nationalism, uh, euphoria, not euphoria, but nationalism feeling is still there. But look at what was the happening on the ground. Peoples were suffering in their day-to-day -day life. Unemployment, price rise, no employment. So these issues also started foregrounding. People started also paying attention on these issues. Yes, nationalism is fine. We take pride in being an Indian because India has become, uh, has emerged as a stronger country in the world. But that that, that I'm not opposing, I'm supporting. I as a voter, I'm saying. Uh, but at the same time, I also need my child to be educated. I also need my child to get a employment. So that these issues also got foregrounded in this election. And I think a lot of credit goes to the opposition parties because they did not leave this issue. They kept campaigning on this issue. And we know that in some constituencies, some state, BJP was really, really cornered on these issues, whether we are talking about Agni Veer uh, or pension scheme, etc., etc. Now, ideologically or in terms of positioning, if Modi's story has to be centered around growth in his third term, uh, and Rahul is claiming some of the, the, the Hinduism space, even though you think it's a bad idea. What will distinguish these two parties, these two leaders? And I ask this because there have been many theories. You have Ajaz Ashraf uh, arguing that this is the Hindu left versus the Hindu right. Uh, you have Hilal uh, Ahmed, uh, who, who basically says the Hindutva versus Hinduism trope just doesn't work. And for the opposition to do it, this is a very limited way to counter the language of the BJP. Instead, he says it has to be social justice countering Hindutva. Now, if, they, if you 
go back to let's say the 90s the bjp used to say mandal bhi hamara ka mandal bhi hamara now the congress is trying to play a little bit of that not the mandir part of it but certainly the mandal part of it right so what is going to happen to caste politics uh i think now this is the new this is going to be the new thing in indian politics at least for the next 5 years uh look at how uh, opposition parties especially samajwadi party and congress especially in up and other parties in other state how they kept uh, they kept arguing that there is a need for caste census the whole narrative on which opposition contested this election was one big narrative was social justice uh peop- there 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 is a need for caste census and there is a need to help those people who are in large numbers but economically socially uh, uh, on the lower ends of the society and look at in the second third fourth fifth phase of election bjp started responding to that they kept mentioning you know how many mps bjp has who belong to the obc caste so you can clearly see that this was the election after a very long time maybe after 10 15 years that congress was setting the agenda and bjp was responding to that and the response of bjp was largely on the issue of social justice so this is going to be continue for at least 5 years i am not sure whether what will happen after 5 years but next few years is going to be politics around social justice politics around caste mobilization but in that caste mobilization how do the two parties take unique positions that separate one from the other and i ask you this because the prime minister has spoken about himself being an obc uh, leader uh, in uttar pradesh when the bjp did do well it was because of non yadav obcs today the opposition the samajwadi party and the congress have made uh, that sort of broader caste base their social justice plank so what is going to distinguish one party from the other on this caste politics issue oh it's going to be very difficult because initially the regional parties and the congress when regional parties were trying to play this caste uh, uh, caste card for mobilization they were just trying to mobilize the upper obc caste and bjp played very well because they in most of the state they just tried to mobilize the non uh, dominant obc caste and look at the tactic pattern of ticket distribution so whether we are talking about bihar up haryana and many other states that was the strategy don't focus too much on the dominant obc caste but focus on the non dominant obc caste because the dominant obc caste is loyal to one or the other regional party uh, if you look at the ticket pattern of ticket distribution in up samajwadi party actually adopted that strategy and if you look at the pattern of ticket distribution of samajwadi party they gave ticket to a very large number of non yadav obc uh, candidates and the csds post poll data clearly indicates that samajwadi party congress were able to make inroads among the non yadav obc caste so what we call the the most the most backward caste among the backward so this strategy samajwadi party has stopped adopted it was the strategy of bjp for the last you know 5 7 years i think they need to rethink both the parties because the this narrative has been now uh, not captured but actually adopted by samajwadi party congress and the india alliance partner so bjp may have to think hard uh, yeah. if they want to go ahead with this whole or go ahead with this whole narrative of social justice they need to think hard it it is not going to be very very easy for the bjp to come up with a new agenda come up with a new mobilization strategy in the next few months now the bjp likes to argue or the bjp supporters like to argue that muslim consolidation was a big reason that it, it formed the way it did in uttar pradesh but actually it's the it is the movement of the dalit vote that played a gigantic part in the bjp actually uh, losing Uh, uh uttar pradesh it was a rout for the bjp in uttar pradesh now dalit vote once the dalit voter sees that there is no threat to the constitution and the and the affirmative action that is protected by the constitution for uh, the scst community do you believe that the dalit voter could move back to the bjp or do you believe that we are in a ba- brand new phase of caste politics uh, very difficult to make any prediction on that but i think uh, even if the dalit you are first you are right if you look at how what is the movement of the voters in how is the movement of voters in up it's not only that samajwadi party india alliance uh, managed to 
you know, perform very well because of only because of the Muslim vote and the Yadav vote. There is a massive movement of Dalit vote in favor of Samajwadi Party Congress Alliance. Uh, now, if, even if there is no threat to the constitution, even if there is no threat to the provision of reservation, I think if Samajwadi Party and Congress are clever enough, the leaders are clever enough, they can keep claiming that we have been able to you know, restrict the BJP and that is why the provision of reservation is still safe. There is no, uh, there is no attack on the constitution. Uh, if BJP had got larger number of seats, the provisions may have got disturbed. So they can still campaign on that. And there could be few more years for, uh, for uh, next few more years, Samajwadi Party, Congress, Opposition Alliance can keep convincing the Dalits that there is a need for them to be consolidated behind India Alliance. Otherwise, they will, there will still be another threat for, uh, you know, changing the provisions of the constitution. So it it is going to it, it is going to be uh, like which how india alliance leaders are going to convey this message or you know send out a positive message to the dalit community yeah let's let's in the end talk about pitfalls for both sides i think in modi's case is that he needs a new story you say that story has to be growth what are the pitfalls for the opposition do you think that they are betraying signs of overconfidence? The BJP keeps saying 99 seats is not, or 100 seats is not a win. Why are you acting as if you're running the government? But the Congress is clearly behaving like a party that believes it's only a matter of time before it has a chance at the central government. They, they seem to be convinced that it's the beginning of the end for the prime minister, even though it's been not even a month since he's been in government. Do you believe that the Congress is being overconfident, or do you believe that this is absolutely valid real politics? Uh, first, look at the numbers. Yes, BJP has got 240 seats, and Congress could not even get 100. They got stuck to 99, 99, 99 seats. But my own sense is that leave aside the numbers. But I think there was a mood of mood for change in this country, though the change did not take place. Because clearly the mood was not as strong as leaders of opposition may have believed. So, but hmm. in my opinion, there is a there was a sign of mood of change in this country. Uh, in my opinion, Congress is, has become overconfident. The problem with the two sides, NDA, BJP is still to you know reconcile with the fact that BJP only has 240 seats in the house. They're still believing that. This is the party which has got more than 300 seats in the parliament. On the other hand, Congress should realize they, that you know they have 199 seats, but they are still in the opposition. They are behaving as such. They are in the treasury bench. They have formed the government. So a lot of work still needs to be done on the part of the Congress. They need to work hard if they want to you know like go back go to the treasury bench. If they want to form the government. That's the big yeah. problem. And that is the root root cause of what we saw happening in the first five days of parliament. Congress is behaving like we are the ruling party. We will decide how the parliament is to run. On the other hand, BJP, which is now below the majority mark, 240, 32 seats less than the majority, they should realize that this is not the BJP government. This is the NDA government. And they need to depend upon the allies. But they are behaving as if, as such, 370 party hai. So I think that's the difficulty. So the, neither the BJP nor the Congress has actually internalized, uh, in a sense, the real import uh, of, of the verdict. The biggest next test, I mean, there's going to be the bipolar results, but the big one is going to be Maharashtra. And in Maharashtra, the opposition still believes that the kind of fragmented wreckage the BJP's games uh, have left uh, it in, the advantage is that of the opposition. If that remains the case, and do you see any reason for it not to, how much of a setback will that be for the BJP, even though it's an assembly election? Well, I think the two upcoming assembly elections are going to be very crucial for BJP, Haryana and Maharashtra. Uh, two possibilities, BJP win the election in Maharashtra along with the allies and they win, manage to win election in Haryana. If they manage to do that, I think they will regain a lot of confidence. And if they manage to lose elections in both the state, I think BJP will be in a very very difficult situation uh, there could be you know like whispers of dissent within the bjp itself so i think a testing time for bjp in the next few months uh, not only haryana and maharashtra goes to poll 
we have elections in jharkhand also we have elections in delhi and by end of next year there will be elections in in bihar so next one and a half years are going to be testing time for the opposition whether they are able to remain united whether they are able to put up a united face against the bjp and whether bjp is able to you know like uh, tilt the story again in its favor by winning large number of these states i just want to end with a, with a very disturbing post poll survey that that you have undertaken on the trust factor in the electoral uh, in the electoral process that's quite an ironic because election 2024 is was seen by many of us actually as an affirmation that at least electoral democracy of india is very healthy that the poorest indian citizen has made his or her view known they have managed to change the direction of politics it seemed like a very healthy moment uh for politics uh, and for democracy but your uh, survey found that 45% of people surveyed actually believe that evms can be manipulated even like you know sy qureshi and others who have head, uh, who have led the election commission not known to be fans of this government have gone hoarse saying the evm can't be manipulated but people don't seem to be responding in that way uh worse 22% expressed little or no trust in the election commission both of these numbers are considerably worse than they were in 2019 can you speak a little bit to these findings uh, first a let a caution that if when it says 45% people believe evm can be manipulated there are two answer categories in that to a great extent and some extent so so it's uh, the figures look so 45% big. 45% believe that they can be manipulated to a great extent is that what it is uh no 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 it, that... it has two answer categories to a great extent and some extent so both okay. the figures have been merged together but yes 45% of the people of the voters have some anxieties about evm they have right. question mark in their mind about uh, whether evms can be manipulated or not it is also true that people's faith in evm has gone down declined compared to the last 5 or 10 years uh, and the other question about uh, neutrality of the election commission uh, also the way things have been happening with regard to conduct of election uh, again 22% little and no trust has been clubbed together 22% people will have little or no trust in election commission both if, if i compare these numbers from the 2019 or 2014 elections uh, the neutrality the there is a question mark people are raising about the neutrality of election commission and about the uh, but how uh, do you how do you, how, how, how do you explain this after the kind of robust election we've just seen see this is this is a perception survey people are not right. technically sound enough to say whether it can be or not it's about a perception perception is that yes something may happen something may may be done so this is a perception survey and this is this this uh, reveals the how people are thinking about the election commission and how people are thinking about the evms uh, it doesn't it not it is not necessary that this perception will always correspond to uh, because these are technical issues can may evms be manipulated or not most of the technical people are saying it cannot be manipulated but since there are lot of lot, lots and lots of charges about that by leaders by leaders of opposition parties and various other people people have started you know like having yeah. little uh, like increasing distrust in evm and increasing uh, distrust in the election commission as well not uh, not exactly uh, uh, you know not exactly findings that would make one happy and at some point these perceptions should be addressed even if they're entirely uh, illogical as you said perception is more about a feeling you hear something again and again you start believing that there maybe there's a measure of truth to it well we live in interesting times sajay kumar ji thank you always a pleasure take care and see you soon it's great to see you here thank you for watching our work if you haven't subscribed yet don't forget to click the bell icon and subscribe to mojo story and support independent robust journalism